Denise, we are ready when you are. Excellent. I think that's Commissioner Suffered and you're ready. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to begin. Is President Preckwinkle on with us? Yes, I am. Okay. So first of all, let me thank everybody, thank everybody who has joined, joined us today. Us today. There you are, President Preckwinkle. I want to thank the president for Put it, helping us put this together and for our ability to deal with our joint constituents here on issues of equity. I want to just mention two people who are on the call uh, who are kind of moral leaders of our general area. One is former Alderman Dolores Holmes from the city of Evanston, and the, the other is Senator B is Sister Benita Cohn from the Benedictine Sisters, who worked with Sheriff Tom Dart years ago to make sure that we stop solitary confinement within the Cook County Jail. So I welcome both of, both of you. Today, we have unique opportunities. George Floyd's death and the COVID-19 has given us a reminder and an opportunity to be better and to participate in a sea change of making our communities stronger. With an equity lens, we are beginning to look at all of the services and the fundings that various governments and especially the county, the county which is um, what I call stealth government. Many of the people do not fully appreciate all of the services we provide, but we are beginning to look in this budget with a new equity lens to be ensure that we are providing the services that people need. Today in the 13th district, we're gonna talk about four of those areas. The 13th district is an area, area that is the uh, Boundaries are from Devon Avenue to Lake Cook Road and from the lake to Harlem. It's the 49th and 50th wards of the city of Chicago. It's the townships of Niles and Nutrier and the city of, of Evanston, Illinois. I want to thank Denise, who is now an Evanstonian and, and our new director of equity. And I thank the president for appointing her uh, and our, our speakers, Marilyn Pagan Banks, who I often joke that I've been with her when people have introduced her as Marilyn Pagan Banks. Uh, and the one thing I know is she is not a pagan. She is one of the most remarkable women. And she, through a Just Harvest, has been feeding people in the Rogers Park, Evanston, and Skokie area for so many years. Charles Hartwick, who works with the Howard Area uh, Community Center and has been kind of the specialist on jobs and the uh, reintroduction of people who have left the penitentiary. Uh, well, Maureen McDonald, who has taken over peer services and is dealing with this opioid crisis that we are in in unique ways and knows so much about the people who need help. And finally, my, my good friend, Ann Fisher Rainey, who runs Turning Point, which is, is one of the most remarkable mental health centers and constantly figuring out how to outreach into various parts of the community to make sure that those who are often for have an opportunity to get the services they, they need. Next week at the county board, we will pass a resolution from uh, Commissioner Brandon Johnson and the other African American members of, this, of the county board, the Justice for Black Lives resolution, which will ask us to redirect funds in an equitable manner to deal with the issues we look at today. It's now my privileged to introduce to you the president of the county board who I've been able to serve with for the last 11 years, a friend of mine who goes back to gun control days in 1973 when I first met her, Tony Preckwinkle. Tony. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Commissioner Sufferden, for that kind introduction. I want to thank everyone who's joined us today, in particular, Commissioner Sufferden, uh, Charles Hardwick, Howard Area Community Center, uh, Reverend, Reverend Marilyn Pagan Banks, thank you, at Just Harvest, Maureen McDonald, Peer Services, Ann Fisher Rainey, Turning Point, Denise Barreto, Cook County Director of Equity and Inclusion. She's with us today to serve as our moderator for our question and answer portion of the program. Thank you all, and thank all of you who've joined us. Together, we'll provide you with an update on Cook County's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and answer questions during the Q&A period. We've held several equity town hall meetings over the past few months, targeting different communities in the county. The purpose of these town halls is to reach out to communities hit hardest by the pandemic and outline our response. 
We also shared resources available to residents and businesses and answered public health questions. While we know that COVID-19 is far from being over, at this point in our progress, we've shifted our focus on this rapid response to a strategy for long-term equitable recovery. What does equitable recovery mean? It means that the county will use an equity lens to target our resources to the greatest need. Let me just say, what we've seen nationally, I would ask that if, if you are being dealt with in other places, I know we've we've learned a lot by uh, keeping our ears open to uh, uh, discoveries and policies that have been implemented across the world. So, uh, no, I, I'm happy to hear that. All right, I think that's Kevin Morrison, Commissioner Kevin Morrison. Could you please um, mute yourself? Um, where was I? I? I think he's probably on another team's meeting. Isn't he still in the budget hearing? That could be it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so where was I? I was talking about equitable recovery and saying that we're going to try to target our resources um, to communities with the greatest need. Uh, nationally, what we've seen is that the, the Latinx and African American communities have seen three times the infection rates of, of the larger uh, white community. And um, that's had a devastating impact on many of the cities and towns and villages in suburban Cook County. The work we've done uh, will be aligned with our policy roadmap, the five-year strategic plan for offices under the president, which uh, we published in November of, of 2018. This May, my office released our Cook County COVID-19 response plan. It's called From Rapid Response to Equitable Recovery. And the plan includes uh, the county's initial response to the crisis and outlines priorities for the next several months. In a continuation of the county's commitment to advancing racial equity, the plan is focused on addressing inequities that have been exacerbated during the pandemic. And what the pandemic has done, I often say, is stripped bare, laid bare, the inequities that were always existing in our communities and our country. We've seen firsthand during the COVID-19 pandemic how glaring the inequities are. We know that in normal times, our black and brown communities struggle with disinvestment, access to health care, food insecurity, lack of economic opportunity, language barriers, and other forms of inequity. These challenges are only exacerbated in times of a public health crisis. We understand the economic toll that the pandemic has taken on small businesses and contractors. And the Cook County a Bureau of Economic Development launched the Community Recovery Initiative to assist small businesses, nonprofits, and independent contractors struggling to make ends meet during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Bureau of Economic Development also stood up the Community Loan Fund, which received more than 2,300 applications, costing $40 million in loans. While the deadline for application is passed, our loan partners are processing and reviewing applications and will be contacting applicants in the coming weeks. Economic development will continue to provide assistance to our, our assistance in our efforts to be sure that new programs over the next several months that we're able to launch with some of the funds that the county has received through the CARES Act serve as many of our residents as possible. Today we focus our discussion on mental health, food insecurity, and criminal justice. Cook County Health provides mental health services, and we know that the anxieties and level of need have risen dramatically due to the pandemic. This is a, a mental health crisis as well as a, a health crisis. And our valued partner, the Greater Chicago Food Depository, has seen more than a 40%, 40% increase in the demand for food during the last several months. With record numbers of residents out of work during the stay-at-home order, food insecurity has risen. We've also tragically seen that violence is on the rise. Heartbreakingly, we see headlines, which underscore the urgent need to approach gun violence by addressing its root causes. Through our Justice Advisory Council since 2013, we've distributed more than $23 million in grants to community-based organizations that focus on violence prevention, recidivism prevention, and restorative justice. We're here this afternoon to listen to the needs of the 13th District, our residents, as we navigate the difficult time ahead together. I look forward to a productive discussion and answering some of your questions. Now we'll turn it over again to Commissioner Sufferton. Thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over to Denise 
In her role, she'll act as the moderator, introduce our speakers, and then work on the questions and answers. And the president and I both look forward to listening. But one thing I do want to just remind people is that in our district, where we have Chicago and the suburbs together, Howard Avenue is not a mountain. It is a flat street. And people go back <laughs> and forth and back and forth. And we, as a community, have to deal with issues on both sides of Howard Street. And I appreciate the ability to be able to discuss how we deal with that through the resources the county has. Denise? Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. Thank you, President Preckwinkle and Commissioner Suffredin. I am delighted to be your hostess today. Um, and I will look forward to answering any questions that you may have, please put them in the chat and we will get to them at the end. We do have a few questions to start everyone off. Uh, but first, I want to allow each of our panelists to introduce themselves and the work that they're doing in the 13th district. So I am going to start with Rev Reverend Marilyn Pagan. Thanks. Um, that the accent over the A is what that means, y'all. That that's I can tell you that if you ever see the accent over the A, that's the one that you say bigger. All right. So, Reverend Marilyn, can you introduce yourself and your work at a Just Harvest, please? Good afternoon. Um, so, yes, thank you for that. I often tease along with Commissioner Suffredin that that A, that accent is the fine line that keeps me from being a pagan. So, <laughs> and so let me start by saying thank you to Commissioner Suffredin for the invitation on today and thank you for President Preckwinkle for allowing us this space uh, during your town hall. Uh, so, yes, I am the Executive Director of A Just Harvest. We are an anti-hunger organization and we work by providing direct service, which for us is meals every single day before COVID, after COVID, during COVID, every single day, a hot meal to our community and all those who come in need of a meal. Uh, we also do other things around food that I'll talk about some more later, but um, wanted to also say we do community organizing around the core issues of what keep people needing to come back, again, pre-COVID, during COVID and after COVID, and you know, as we, as some folks refer to as COVID-16-19, uh, the need to make sure that our communities have access to what they need. Um, that's the kind of work that we do. And then we also engage in community and economic development, understanding that we uh, need to create jobs, that there are gifts right here in the community. Our folks have a lot of what they need to do the work and we have to be there to support them and provide the resources and, and the space to build and create and to and to imagine and dream ways in which that they can support their families and um, create the community that we all want. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you That's very us. much. I'm gonna turn it over to Charles Hardwick to introduce himself from the Howard Area Community Center. Charles, take it away. We'll unmute you first. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. First of all, I want to thank Madam President, uh, Commissioner Sufferton, and also you, Denise, for uh, allowing me to participate in this uh, town hall meeting. Uh, as was said, my name is Charles Hardwick. I'm the program manager for Howard Area's oh. Employment Resource Center. I'm funded, uh, we're able to do the work that we do, and I've been doing it for 20 years here at Howard Area. Uh, we're funded by the Shai Cook Workforce Partnership, uh, also Illinois Department of Corrections, and also the F Department of Family and Support Services. And with that funding, we're able to help individuals realize some of their dreams. Um, and I'm so glad that we're talking about equity because a lot of the people that I think uh, the commissioner is talking about in uh, District 13 is that uh, individuals returning home from incarceration. Uh, with serious, serious barriers, uh, academic barriers, digital barriers, and we're here to help with that. And thanks for the funding that we do have. And I talked to the commissioner yesterday and earlier today. Uh, we just need more resources up here in this district. And with the help of Madam President and the continued help of Shai Cook Workforce Partnership and Department of Family and Support Services, and also with the Illinois Department of Corrections, I think if we just had a little bit more sauce added to that, we'll be able to really recognize the equity 
because we're working also with individuals who don't have the academic astuteness, who don't have high school diplomas, and who are probably not well suited for some of the programs that we're funded with. Uh, uh, Howard area has a vast amount of wraparound services. So fortunately, we're, we're able to do ESL uh, one through four. We're also uh, GED programs and our family literacy programs. So we'll talk more about who we are at Howard Area Community Center as this town hall meeting progresses. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Charles. I'm going to turn it over to Maureen McDonald from Peer Services. Maureen, please take the time to introduce yourself and your work in the 13th District. Sure. Um, so thank you uh, also echoing my colleagues to Commissioner Sufferton and President Preckwinkle and to Denise for inviting us all to participate. Um, the 13th district is such a vast and varied place and I've been at Pier now for three years and learning all the communities and the sub communities. Um, I live in Rogers Park, I work in Evanston, you know, it's a world of difference, right? In the walk from one place to another and yet sometimes not at the same time, right? Um, so peer services, um, for those of you who don't know us, we are the community substance abuse treatment provider um, serving Evanston, the northern neighborhoods in Chicago and the surrounding communities in the northern suburbs. Um, we focus almost exclusively on low income residents. Um, and so we work with all of the public funding opportunities as well as we try to raise money to make sure that no one's ever turned away because they can't pay. Um, and uh, we, um, like Reverend Marilyn, uh, we never close. We're in a simple health care facility, so we continue to provide medication-assisted treat treatment every day from the middle of March to today, as we have for 45 years. Um, and we serve a total of about 1,100 clients a year. Our clients range in, age, range in age from 12 to 90. We just had someone complete treatment who was 90. Um, and so, you know, we really are a community focused organization. What I will say um, is that the, the, between the pandemic and the recent events, the mental health crisis that uh, President Preckwinkle called and uh, everything else that we are all dealing with, our clients are really suffering. And we know that people who are not our clients, but we would like to work with are really suffering. Um, we have seen overdose deaths skyrocket in the last couple of months, not just in Chicago, not just in Evanston, but around the country. Um, there's a lot that we can do, and I'll, like Charles, I'll wait. We can talk about that. Um, but it is really um, the, com the combination of everything that's happened in the last month, I, I think, has taken a situation that was already very difficult, exposed it for what it is, but also made it much harder. Uh, we are finding people really struggling right now and um, they need all of your support. So thank you for inviting us to participate. Thank you. And finally, we'll have Ann Fisher-Rainey from Turning Point introduce herself and the work that she's doing in the district. Ann? Thank you. Thank, thank you again. And I wanna echo, echo what my colleagues said. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about Turning Point Behavioral Health Care, which is located in Skokie but we see about 1,300 individuals a year who come from all over Chicago. In fact, only one of three of our clients comes from Skokie. We see everyone who can get to us, including some folks who even make it from Wisconsin and Indiana. Um, I hope that's because our programs and services are special and they provide a recovery for people who are dealing with mental illness. 90% of our clients are poor. And many of them have Medicaid or they are dealing with some sort of benefits issue. Um, we're very grateful for support from our townships and the state. And we continue to fundraise as Maureen mentioned to, to fill that gap. But we do have a commitment to equity and the way we see equity is access as a path to equity. So access is very important for us. No one is turned away. Um, and again, in the middle of May with the others, we made what we hope was a fairly graceful leap from uh, in-person to virtual services. And we're providing 80% of our services now virtually. We have groups for people with severe and persistent mental illness. 
and 25 of those groups are now being offered virtually. So we haven't slowed down in our effort to try to help people with severe mental illness to maintain themselves out of a hospital or a more restricted um, means of care. A couple programs I just want to mention are we have an instant intake program so people can literally call us and begin their services on the very day that they call. We've had that as an in-person service, now it's virtual. We also have a program called the Living Room, which is for anyone who feels that they're at risk of emergency. And that again has translated to virtual. There's no cost for it. Any adult who worries that they might have to go to an emergency room, might be arrested, might be in a terrible family situation, can be treated by people who are themselves adults in recovery from mental illness. The last thing I want to say is that we think, as we think of access as a path to equity, we're also really working on integrative care. And so about a year and a half ago, um, Turning Point Behavioral Health Care Center was joined by Heartland Health Centers, and they now have a primary care center in our building on uh, 8324 Skokie Boulevard, which is basically Maine and Skokie Boulevard. That primary health center is open to anyone who comes. They don't have to be related to Turning Point. And we hope that that, again, is a way that we can look for what President Practical called inequities that have been exacerbated and try to meet those needs. So thank you. Thank you for letting me be. No, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you all for your very um, robust introductions. I'm just going to remind folks to put us on put us on mute if you're not speaking, so we don't have to hear your noise. So before I, I I have a couple questions to get us started, and apart from that, I also want to just ground us in what equity means. I think oftentimes people talk about equity, and there's sometimes an assumption that people are all on the same page. So I do want to uh, wrap around the way we look at equity at Cook County. Equity is achieved by intentionally, deliberately eliminating inequities and disparities adversely impacting marginalized people in a just and fair society. Equity is achieved when people have the opportunity to achieve optimal life outcomes, reach their full potential, and no one is deprived from achieving their potential due to their race, gender, sex, economic position, position or other social determinants. So I just wanted to be sure and ground us in what we mean by equity, because that's going to come up a lot. And I just don't want pe people pulling in their own definitions. I want us all working from the same sheet of music. So that's what we mean by equity. Um, and, and particularly at the county, we are focused on equity as well as the additional layer of racial equity, um, because we know that um, equity by itself, if you focus just on that and you don't look at the various intersections, um, you can have some adverse uh, um, unintended consequences to that. So thank you for thank you for grounding with me in that. Uh, the first question that I have for the panelists, and this is for any of you, so you know feel free to jump in, and I'm sure every one of you have a have an answer. Um, obviously during uh, this time, and, and I love because two out of the four panelists, when they introduced themselves, they said, you know, we're doing what we always do, because that's the truth. Um, what, what, what happens in times of crisis is we double down on who we are, and we double down and we do more of what we do. I mean, I love to say that's part of why I was added to Cook County during this time. Um, equity is not new to the county, and I am not going to own equity. Equity has been embedded in our values and 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 having me as the coach and the shepherd of equity is just um, the, the county's way of doubling down on what they were already doing. So I want to ask the group, what are you doing specifically for the most vulnerable folks during this time? Because again, I know you've all been doing this work before now, but obviously this this crisis has laid bare um, you know, how, just how deep the inequities are. Can anyone jump in with, you know, what you're doing at your place for the most vulnerable right at this time? So I'll start. Oh. <laughs> um, and I, I'm thank you for grounding it. And so what, again, what we continue to do is to provide meals. So our vision is to create a world of shared abundance and radical belonging, right? 
And we do that through our mission of making sure we're providing nutritious meals while cultivating community and economic development and organizing across racial, cultural, and social economic lines in order to create a more just society. So we, we, like you said, we double down in those efforts and that has shown up in almost 12,000 meals since uh, April through July 7th, when I did a report for the board, 1,100 more meals per month, almost 300 new folks that had never been through our doors. And of those meals, 1,300 of them were veteran meals. That's not talking about the groceries we're helping to deliver. That's not talking about our partnership with the rapid response team. That's not talking about the food that we put into a, a truck and send over to the south side or the west side with our partners. We are making sure that people have access to food and we're grateful for all of our partners who help make that happen. And I wanna point out that we do not require any proof of residency, any proof of need. If you show up, you get a meal. And so because we're located right at the uh, Red Line Transportation Hub, we get folks from all of the suburbs, we get folks on their way to work, from the south side, we get folks from everywhere and all are welcome. And I needed to really say that. And we want folks to know that we are a community kitchen. So if you're coming because you need to be out and seen for that for that moment before this isolation occurred, then then that's why you know we we say we you don't have to show a proof of need. The need may simply be I need to be around other people, right? Wow. But the other thing that we really are buckled down around is around defunding the Cook County Jail. So we were part of the um, free them all because you know we know that a lot of our folks, these numbers that are coming in for COVID-19 are folks that are locked up and can't socially distance while they're in jail. And then also understanding that when we're, since we're talking about budgets and I know there's a vote today that each year Cook County spends more than 600 million supporting a racist system of policing and incarceration through the Cook County Sheriff's budget, which includes the Sheriff's police, the Cook County jail and more. We need to defund the Cook County Jail and invest in our communities. If we had allowed the budget to go down proportionately to the number of people locked up, we would have 117 million more for other public services in Cook County. Our folks need housing, they need health care, mental health services, living wage jobs, public transportation, and restorative justice. When we talk to our folks about pre COVID, and like I said, during COVID, What's bringing you here when we have conversations, it's it's being able to pay rent and eat. It's being able to pay for their medications and eat. It's being able to send their kids uh, to school with clean clothes and the supplies they need and also feed their children. And people should not have to make choices between food and, and, and things that they need to, to live and, 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 you know, between those two things, right? And so we need to support these programs. And one way to do that is to defund the Cook County Jail System. And I do want to thank our commissioner for supporting uh, this resolution, uh, the Black Lives Resolution. Um, and so we're encouraging all, all of our commissioners to vote yes in support of that. And so those are some of the ways that we continue to make sure that the most vulnerable are, are, are being attended to right now. Thank you, Reverend Marilyn. It's always hard to follow, <laughs> Reverend. I know, right? I would hate to be the one, hate to be the one. I'll make an attempt. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the leadership at Howard Area Community Center. Uh, you know, I did not mention this in our introduction, but Howard Area has never closed its doors before or even after this pandemic uh, came into our lives. Uh, and we've delivered food. Our staff volunteered to actually deliver food to people's homes, the disenfranchised individuals in the Rogers Park and a little bit outside of Rogers Park communities. Uh, on Thursdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays, we were delivering food to people's houses. People would call in and literally uh, uh, place an order for food and we'll deliver it to their homes. Uh, with the leadership of uh, Karen Norton Reeve, the CEO of Chicago Cook Workforce uh, Partnership, uh, we've been able to, during COVID-19, we've been able to provide Uber transportation for individuals to get back and forth to work. Uh, we've been able to provide digital uh, components, let it be a laptop or whatever, so people, because we've been working digitally. And as you can see, I'm in my office today and my staff, they're here. Uh, everybody's working on, on a sl sliding schedule, but the services haven't stopped. Uh, 
we go out to the transitional housing programs that's in Rogers Park and even on the west side of Chicago. But I think we're just focusing right now on the 13th district. So I'll kind of stay there for right now. But services have not ended. Um, we've got direction from um, from uh, the Cook Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership that we are alive and kicking. We're offering services. We're paying for people to participate in training. We're supporting so many of the nursing uh, students so they can continue their education and become the nurses that we need so dearly in these times. So the work hasn't stopped. Howard area hasn't shut down. Uh, we didn't take, take off because of COVID-19. And I just want to continue to do the stuff that we're doing. And we're working with that population that we're talking about, that vulnerable population. Uh, if you don't fit into one of our program requirements, we have other ways that we can work with you. So no one's ever turned away from our program and services are always here and available. And Howard Area Community Center as a whole has uh, provided us with the opportunity to be able to help our customers, our GED students. We bought laptops and provided them all with laptops so they can continue their education. Individuals returning home from incarceration. We've been doing uh, virtual job readiness training uh, for Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. We've been doing virtual enrollment, virtual while applying for what we call an independent training account to pay for people to continue to further their education so they can get to work. And uh, under the leadership of our Director of Business Relations and Economic Development, Pedro Leslie, uh, we are always talking to employers and talking about equity. Uh, one of my main things is that everybody may not be qualified for a job, but with some training, most people can do most of the jobs that are out here. And so we're working with employers to say, if that resume doesn't read the way you want it to read, take a look at this individual. And we have a team that's out here and, and paying attention to all the sectors in the county and Chicago and helping employers to understand that we have individuals, we have individuals that want to work, that's willing to work, and then we support them as well as our employer partners. So the work hasn't stopped and that that vulnerable population, that disenfranchised group of individuals that we're talking about, those are the ones that really, really needed us to step the game up during COVID-19. Uh, I've worked with some of the hospitals. Uh, I say I, but my whole team have worked with some of the hospitals, individuals being released from the Cook County Jail and finding themselves in a, in a Wise Hospital or St. Francis Hospital. Uh, they've been able to call Howard Area Community Center and say, what services do you have for re-entry, for this re-entry population? And our outreach coordinator who has a dedicated phone line that he sleeps with uh, during this COVID-19 and answers that phone. And I also, had uh, the office phone kind of connected to my cell phone. So we were always available to answer questions. And one of the larger things that we were doing in the beginning of this COVID-19 for that vulnerable population is helping people to apply for unemployment compensation and then following through, you know, to make sure that everything is certified and all that. So the work is being done and there's more work that needs to be done. And there's more financial assistance that we need to continue to do this work at a higher level than we're able to do it with that vulnerable population that we're serving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maureen or Ann? Either of you want to chime in? I, I think Ann got disconnected. I've just texted Alex. Oh, okay. Try and help her get back on. So all right. So we'll let Matt, we'll let Maureen. Yeah, we'll let Maureen okay. talk now. <laughs> Thank sure. you. I'm happy to. Um, so, you know, the first couple weeks of COVID, when we went from well pre-COVID operations to emergency operations, you know, like everybody did, um, was just an awful lot of trying to help people understand the situation we were in. We definitely had clients who didn't believe that the virus was a real thing. And so there was just tons of basic health education, like why we were taking precautions, why we were screening people at the door, why we were encouraging people, you know, when it was time to wear masks, like lots of just like, no, really, this is serious and we need you to, to do it with us. Um, and then I would say we were also very busy rethinking like, 
where do people get their primary support? You know, if you're used to going to a, a AA or a 12-step recovery meeting or another self-help group every day, and that's a core part of your your recovery, you know, that just really became unavailable at least for a couple of weeks um, till organizations started to, you know, work out how to deliver these online. So um, we started offering things like uh, we actually have a fair amount of our services offered through telehealth. Um, even if the counselor's in the office, the person is at home. Um, and we uh, have been doing as many free recovery support groups, uh, both for adults, for parents, for teenagers, you know, as we can work out how to do and publicize um, because we just feel like we need to be available, you know, as available as we can to whoever needs us. Um, because we knew the risk of overdose was increasing, we have been, uh, we were fortunate to receive some Narcan through the Chicago Recovery Alliance through the state of Illinois. So we try to make sure everybody has at least one kit, if not two, um, and able to share them. And that's an area that really urgent need, you know, where really any unit of government can make a difference right now um, in the supply. Um, we also worked out how to deliver medications at home, which is not something the DEA ever allowed us to do before, but you know, they created some easements during COVID that made that possible when that was necessary. Um, something else that, that wasn't initially the first part of the epidemic, but after George Floyd was murdered and it was so public and everyone was so aware of what happened, um, that was when our client, nearly all of whom have been arrested or incarcerated or both at one time in their lives, um, started really talking about their experiences with police and their experiences in jail and prison um, in a way that had never, uh, it got much deeper and much richer. Um, and we were very grateful that they would trust us with the conversation and also that they would want to work out how to work that into their own recovery. You know, so how do I think about myself in this moment and how do I manage, you know, um, how do I understand what I may have experienced before as sort of anxiety or depression I couldn't name, but now I know why I have it, you know, and so it's been a real journey of discovery for us and our clients in the last few weeks um, that I think is fundamentally really important in our work and that we need to continue to work on. I think if there were two two additional things that we would do right now, one is with the uh, overdoses expanding so rapidly, we really need to double up on all kinds of medication assisted treatment to help people keep, keep people alive while they find their path to recovery. Um, it's very challenging for a small clinic like us to make those investments because um, we don't have money to invest, but we would like to grow the service. So that's something that we have the licensing and capacity to do that I think would make a difference. And the other is, I think, the conversation that has been happening in the context of um, if we're going to move funds from policing and criminal justice to services in the community, you know, what does really meaningful outreach look like? My staff asked in our first town hall meeting on equity internal meeting, my staff asked, why is it that we wait till people are in trouble to work with them? You know, about half of our clients come to us referred by the justice system or their school or their job. And they said, we would like to work with many more people earlier. And so we're starting to work out, you know, how could we do that? And, and I think we're not alone in that and would love to partner with people who are involved in this meeting around how to do it, how to fund it, how to support it, because there's no question that uh, the kinds of substance abuse prevention and intervention services that are available in wealthier communities are not available in low income communities, in communities that are mostly made up of black and brown. And that is just wrong. And that leads us exactly where we are today. Um, so I look forward to working with everyone to change it. Excellent. Thank you. And Anne, I, I understand you're back. Do you want to tackle that question on what you all have been doing for the most vulnerable members of the community? Sure. Thank you. And I am back. I had a little connection problem. Um, but, but thanks for letting me answer this question. I, I think initially what we found was that a number of our clients didn't have access to Wi-Fi 
or didn't have telephones that could let them use telehealth or didn't have any sort of um, device that would allow them to use Zoom. And some of this may already have been said, but I, I think that, that what we've run into is um, we can do group work pretty well if we have the capacity for people to see each other. So one of the things that we've done is um, we were longtime friends of the Skokie Public Library. They provided us with six refurbished Chromebooks, which actually are now allowing us to hold 25 different um, groups for persons with severe mental illness every week, including some drop-in groups. So when we trans transitioned from doing in-person to uh, virtual behavioral health care, one of the things we realized was that we needed drop-in groups for people who weren't quite sure where they fit into a conversation or a, or a, a structure. We also needed them for our staff, and, and maybe someone has mentioned this as well, but, but our staff were hit very hard by the quick transition. And then with Mr. Floyd's murder, there has been just so much trauma that I think has been experienced on both sides of the therapy relationship. And so we have taken time to do some extra meetings, to have some drop-in meetings, some self-care sessions, some educational sessions. And that has, that's been very, very important. Um, I know that one thing that Maureen and I have talked about a little bit in terms of integration and strengthening our services is how wonderful it would be to be able to build for us, substance abuse treatment, and perhaps for Maureen, behavioral health into our services. I think we already are, are really good partners and we're very, very fond of each other in our community, really trust each other. But if our living room program, for example, had some substance abuse expertise uh, on site, I think that it could be a terrific benefit. And We've had some conversations with St. Francis Hospital about establishing a living room there. And again, I think if we had a substance abuse clinician or three or seven, um, it would be great, a huge deterrent. And also such a respectful way to provide services to people before they get into terrible trouble or if they're in trouble, for them to come to a place that is not police oriented, that's not even particularly treatment oriented, but is more accepting of whatever is happening at that current time. Excellent, thank you so much. So I have one other question before we get to questions from our audience and our participants, and please do put those questions on Facebook, put those questions in our chat. Uh, we have very various people that are more capable than me monitoring that, so I will get to them. Um, my second question, so I live in the 13th district. I'm a, I, I work for the county. There's lots of people on this call who want to know how can ordinary people, residents and business owners in the 13th district, what can we do to support your efforts? Because I hear what you're saying and I'm thinking, okay, where do I, where do I sign up or where do I do something? So can you, all of you um, address that, share how ordinary people, residents and other folks because you know everyone like you said a couple of you said we're all experiencing trauma and we all want to redirect some of our energy during this time and especially those that might be more fortunate than others so can you please tell us how ordinary folks could get involved in in your work charles do you want to lead off for us sure i will uh so ordinary people the first thing that i've said <laughs> i said in the past is like speak to the community you know don't don't just we have we we were in a meeting yesterday and our community is so divided you know we have the people who are considered that uh top echelon of the community then you have the guys and the ladies on the street that's doing what they do uh and both have like this undocumented fear of each other you know the people on my block is afraid that you, Denise, all you want to do is see them locked up. And the people that lives and buy condos in our uh, 13th district think that I just want to lock my door and I just hope violence don't come to my house, to my doorstep. Uh, and I think that that perception is just that, a perception. 
I think the people who are on the block, if I can use that to define the vulnerable population, uh, they want to be a part. They just don't feel like they're included in the changes that's happening in the 13th district. And uh, you see all the development, the development happening, and they think that they're not a part of it. They're not included in it. And we talked about this yesterday. So the first thing, speak, talk, say good morning, say good afternoon. Uh, and secondly, uh, volunteer, you know, come to these agencies and volunteer and get to know the individuals that need your help and not just the agencies, but the individuals that need your help. And, and then let's, then we're making this a real community. We're making this a real 13th district. Um, and, and lastly, um, businesses, you know, businesses are moving into our community and, and this is a trend and I'm just going to be open with it. Businesses are coming into our community with the ready-made staff. They're not hiring people from our community. And, and that's a problem. You know, you see things flourishing in the 13th district, but the community are not inclusive. Sure, you can get hired at the, at the Jewel. You can get hired uh, at uh, the T-Mobile shop. But what about the businesses that's keeping the community afloat? Uh, you know, people say, well, they don't have the skill set. But my thing for the past 20 years is that I figured out that most people can do just about any job. All we have to do is be willing to give a person a shot, train a person, and let's trust each other first before we start saying we don't trust each other. And so I, I think that's one of the things that the community is doing. And I, I, I have to recognize my funders because what they afford us an opportunity and most mostly Department of Family and Support Services and also Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership. I mean, we have funding streams that pay employers to train an individual to be. I'm sorry. No, that's great. That's okay. awesome. So, so I'm sorry. I, I thought I, I think I was hearing myself, but our funders, you know, they they have they have funding streams to pay these employers, you know, if they're paying a certain livable wage, if they have benefits, and we can help, you know, when we we talk out, we're a drum major for this. Uh, Chicago Cook Workforce Partnership uh, and our business service team, we're going out and we're saying to employers, you know, we have people and if they need training or if you need to be able to train them, we will support you financially to train these individuals to be able to work in their own communities. And so I think that's what employers can do. I think that's what community residents can do and agencies are doing it, but we can't do it alone and build a trust within our community. I hope I answered the question. No, you definitely did. And I recorded some of the things you said in the chat for people to, to read. Uh, anybody else, I mean, he gave us a great list, but anybody else jump in with ways that regular people and businesses can contribute to um, helping you uh, meet your objectives? Since Marilyn? he followed me, I'm gonna follow him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and again, um, reiterating our vision is creating a world of shared abundance and radical belonging. So I agree with Charles, yes, you gotta get to know your neighbors. You have to see your neighbors as your neighbors, right? Um, and it's wonderful to that we're putting Black Lives Matter signs on our lawns and we're standing on the corners letting folks blow their horns and, and supporting <laughs> it. But we also have to be willing to, to put in the work and that means um, asking ourselves, when we think about uh, public safety, what does that look like? Does it look like keeping impoverished black people incarcerated because they can't pay a money bond? Or does it look like a society with decent jobs, accessible health care, and well-funded public transportation? So get engaged in the, in the um, work that is happening. Um, yes, the volunteering, we love our volunteers. We need our volunteers. We're so grateful for all of them and our food partners that that are all over the 13th district. Uh, we have folks that are in Northfield and Glencoe and all over, we're grateful for them. But we also want our folks to engage in this policy work, uh, which means um, fighting for a fair tax, right? We need to make sure that we are, the, those who have more resources are paying their fair share, fighting for a living wage, right? We had a huge strike yesterday. People need to earn enough to be able to feed their families. And so yes, we need volunteers and yes, we need the food depository and food, we need to be able to change the system. 
Um, and we need to end money bail. People shouldn't be sitting in jail because they don't get their bail. Um, while we're engaging in this in the work that we need to check our own anti-blackness, right? Check our own microaggressions, engage in the work of being anti-racist and fighting white supremacy. Because if we really want to end hunger and poverty, it's going to take all of that. So we, we welcome you. Once we open our doors back for volunteers, we welcome you to come check us out. But in the meantime, there is lots of work to do, uh, including, like I just said, defunding the Cook County Jail and getting to know your neighbors and making sure that, uh, aside from the sign, that you're also showing up with your vote and with your calls, right, to get the work done. And I know the last thing is, Fill out the census, invite your, yes. remind your family members yes. and your neighbors to fill out the census. You know, our count really does matter. And those resources really make a difference. And we got to make sure we get them in our communities. That's yes. how you can get involved. Thank you. And I made some notes of what all the great things that she said in the chat as well. Any, Ann or Maureen want to add anything that regular folks can do to help you with your work? Sure. You want to go first? Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm listening to all of these great ideas and I'm thinking about how even though we at Turning Point try to say yes to everything, I think sometimes it is possible that we kind of get into our little parochial sort of groups and we, we don't necessarily reach out beyond them. And this is a real lesson for me in remembering that we, we live in a community that's very vibrant and has lots and lots of resources. So. I want to tell you about three pretty concrete things, um, and maybe this group could be of help. We often are looking to hire members of our community, but we have a hard time knowing what measures we should use to reach out to them and let them know that we have jobs. And I'm talking about um, jobs that range from some billing that may require some skills, but we teach um, clerical work clinician work, and so I'd love to think about how we can employ more and more people from our community of all ages and all backgrounds. That's that's a real need for us. Um, secondly, uh, we are planning to have some focus groups in the upcoming months, and we're going to do them virtually. So I'd love to use this group, if we could, as one means by which to invite people to tell us about what they need when it comes to crisis work, because it will be around our living room program and the increased hours. And we're looking for advice about what people need and when they need it and how they would like to receive um, care. The third thing is, um, and again, I'm being really concrete, but you know, it's, it's a good time for it. Uh, we need board members. And, and I think, right, I think looking for board members it is a tough, tough thing. Um, it's, it's hard to know whom to approach. It's hard to know mm -hmm. really representing our communities. I, I can see lots of faces right now that I'd love to invite. Um, but I'd also love to think about that as a community. How do we make sure that our, our organizations are represented by all the people who live in our communities. And, and how do we, um, just one more word about this, how do we authorize people who may not feel that they're board member material, or may not feel that they can really manage this? How can we provide them with bridges and skills and education that will allow them to take their legitimate place in helping to oversee community organizations. I would love to work on that sort of project. And I really hope you reach out to me after this, after this okay. meeting. Excellent. I well, I'm I'm too. Love it. This is Charles right. Hardwick. Uh, uh, I think, I yeah. So I, I really hope you will reach out to me and we could talk more in depth about some of the things that you're hoping for. All right, Charles, let's do some scheming. Yeah. <laughs> Ma Maureen, anything? And then I've got a couple of uh, questions from our audience that I would love to address. Maureen, after sure. you finish. Um, so I, I have uh, Alex get and Ranny, the Shy Cook Works thing. Um, so I, I just wanted to really echo what Charles 
and Reverend Marilyn and Ann said that all of these things will make a difference for the, the whole community and they'll make a difference for the people that we serve, right? Like we all, we all have a piece of the community's infrastructure, but if my clients can't eat or they can't get work, right. or you know, they can't take their rightful place in community leadership, like all of these things are interactive, you know, and so I almost don't want to add anything of my own, but I'm going to add one thing. Um, and uh, we would, uh, by the way, we would love to participate in collaborative board member development with all of you because that is super important to us. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, the thing I wanted to mention, and this is something everybody on this call can have a hand in, is that whether you have a lot of resources and privilege, or whether you have very little, this is an incredibly hard time. And we have a lot of reservations and reticence about asking for help or saying, you know what, I don't feel like I'm doing very well and I need help coping. Um, and this is that time, like we all need to lean on each other. Um, and there's an awful lot of support we can offer each other. It doesn't even need to be like formal structured substance abuse or mental health treatment, right? People are really suffering. And I think we need, um, in substance abuse treatment, what we work on with people is helping people find their own innate coping skills and building those personal strengths and things so that they don't need to use substances. And this is just an incredibly hard time and um, we need all of us to, to help each other. Um, I would certainly encourage you, if you're worried about somebody in your world and substance use, we are able and licensed and open to working with family members. You can call us. You know the same thing. And I don't mean to speak for Anne, but I know she would say, please call us. So I'm just going to say that. Um, yeah, help us, you know, help us help you, help us help each other. We got to get through this together. Excellent. All right. So I want to get to the first question from our um, audience, and I'm going to read it because it has some um, it has some acronyms I'm not familiar with, but you guys might be. It says, as an AODA counselor, my concern is that there's a lack, thank you, of self-help FTF meetings for patients to experience more adequate opportunities for building sober support networks in the recovery community. Are you seeing a rise in the SA? And I don't know what SA is, but can you, would you address that, Maureen? Because you're like the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, AOD, alcohol and other drug abuse, right? So this is one of my, one of my immediate colleagues. So I'll share what I think. Um, yes, it is terribly hard that people don't have face-to-face -face that they can go to right now. Yeah, so, and that is... You know, a lot of a lot of meetings take place in churches and hospitals, and so you know, restrictions on the number of people, concerns about face-to-face -face meeting safety. I think that's what keep, is keeping us really from being able to rebuild that resource right now. And it's really hard. Um, there are a lot of recovery support groups online, um, but I think the combination of the stress from the pandemic the stress inner and outer community turmoil that followed Mr. Floyd's murder, the, um, and just the economic pressure, it's really extreme, you know? And so, yes, we are absolutely seeing an increase in substance abuse, that's the SA, um, and that is manifesting in just one part, that's manifesting in increased overdoses, uh, two to four times the number of overdose deaths this year, as in last year at this time, which is absolutely heartbreaking to me as a person with a lot, you know, many, many people in jeopardy. Um, and uh, and so it's a it's tough. It's tough. And I don't know the solution around recovery support groups. It's possible there's someone participating on this call who's an active member. Um, and maybe willing to share some information. So I just welcome that person, somebody to, to speak up if they are willing to do so. Absolutely. Anybody out there? Thanks for giving us all the, the acronyms because I was like, SA? No <laughs> idea. F2F, face to face. Thank you. I learned a lot. 
Anybody else, anybody want to chime in on that? If not, I can get to our next question. Uh, we got a question from Facebook and it asks, how are these various organizations working to address systemic collective and inter intergenerational trauma? That's a big one, actually. <laughs> So one of the ways that we're trying to do that is by creating spaces where people are able to tell their own stories and really begin to, um, you know, dig into those hard places sometimes and, it, and be given just space, right? It's, it doesn't have to be programmed. It doesn't have to look a certain way. It's just a knowing that we are here. Um, you belong here. We care about this experience that you're having or whatever, and just creating that space. Um, we're really honoring people's, uh, uh, their expertise, right? And so we're not telling them that they're traumatized, but when their stories, understanding and, and, and attempting to work with the trauma-informed lens. So partnering with others to get training ourselves and training our staff um, and, and really looking at things and not just uh, making assumptions or presumptions about why something happened or what the behavior, where the behavior came from, but having a sense of compassion and empathy and understanding the compounded trauma that our community is experiencing. When you have years and years of poverty or generations and generations of incarceration or multiple uh, deaths, whether by police violence or community violence, those need to be addressed. And so like, Charles said earlier, knowing our neighbors, speaking to them, looking into their eyes and telling them that you're sorry they lost someone, no matter who they are and what they're engaged in. Like we like to, you know, save it for the people who once they're, you know, past a certain point. But we're like right now in this space and, and just showing some love, showing some real love. If I can just add a couple of things. Um, I'm a member of a group called Scott. <laughs> And we have been sponsoring seed groups in the Chicago and Evanston, or Skokie and Evanston area. And those groups uh, bring people together to have uh, conversations that can create change. So those are occurring um, in our area. Turning Point is also a year initiative to become a trauma informed organization. And so we're doing a lot of, of work, uh, studying together, talking together. But I think we could definitely join with some other organizations to have larger conversations about trauma and how we're experiencing them and how our communities are experiencing them. There also is a strong uh, group of people who are studying ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences um, levels which really feed into trauma and I think help us to bring a more nuanced understanding and for people who've experienced it, help them legitimate and sort of place some of the experiences that, that they may not have been able to deal with before. And I just wanna, I just wanna add a very small piece to this, if I may. Sure. Um, and so historically, you know, we've had what's called an overcomers group and I'm not a clinician, so I'm not going to pretend to be one, but just putting a group of people together. And I think that, uh, I think I come from that population that we're talking about, you know, raised in housing projects, raised very poor, and, and just bringing a group of men and women together. And, and it's amazing what you see in these groups when one person starts to sharing and, and, uh, and how everyone else opens up and, I had a young lady in one of our groups, and I won't go too in depth, but uh, the question was, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And her response to that question was, every man that looks at me wants to have sex with me, my brother, my uncle, my father. And, and it was just, it was amazing how the other 26 people just wanted to share something that deep and something that private. And, right. and we walked away that night Everyone's hugging each other. And we are attempting to put that group back together virtually. And, uh, and I think that this goes back to community being a real community. And so just in that room, people became a community. And, and I think that's real important, just having a space where people can talk 
and know that no one's going to giggle, grin, or go and gossip about their issues. And so systemically, that's kind of what we're how we're dealing with it. Thank you. Um, I want there's um, a question, a couple of questions that are slightly off topic that have come in on on the Facebook, but I do want to go ahead and give them um, air. One of them is related to tax. This would be addressed to President Preckwinkle and Commissioner Sufferden. And let me let me read it. It had they they give the there's like a hypothetical. Hold on, I'm getting to it. It says, how about addressing the exuberant taxes we are paying? The ten thousand dollar TIF amount on a fourteen thousand dollar tax bill, where we've done zero to help the West Side. Um, either of you want to tackle tax and TIF? Well, well, the question, the question, go ahead, go ahead, Tony. <laughs> They're both jumping at it. <laughs> uh, so the question relates to the, the West Side, which sort of isn't in the third district. That's the first, uh, that's right. the first point. Um, I would encourage that person in the chat feature to provide us with contact information and we'll uh, try to be in touch. I, I think, um, you know what I what I always say is if you want good government you have to pay for it and um, you know while I'm sympathetic to folks who complain about their taxes whether it's property taxes or sales taxes you know I think uh, county government provides uh, a health care safety net for our residents we take anybody who comes to the door uh, in our health and hospital system which is half of our budget uh, we run the criminal justice system so that's the courts and the jails. We, speaking to an earlier point, we've worked hard on the county side with advocates uh, to reduce the reliance on cash bond. That's been one of our priorities over the last several years. And we've seen a dramatic reduction in the bill. Increased reliance on cash bond. Um, but yeah, again, I'd come back to the point. So one, we, we provide health care to anybody who comes to the door. We've done that for 180 years. Secondly, we run our criminal justice system. These are critical functions in our society. And again, if you if you want the government, you have to pay for it. If you if you um, have a particular question, um, person from the west side, um, please uh, put your contact information in the chat feature, and we'll have somebody respond to you. Thank you. Let, let me just say that as we talk about equity, equity and taxation is is uh, something that really is essential. And uh, we're going through the payment of our property taxes right now, and Rogers Park has had a very significant increase in their property taxes. Evanston, 11,000 of 13,000 residential properties have had over a $1,000 increase in their taxes. The same thing is true in, in, Niles, or in Niles Township and in New Jersey Township. So uh, w when we look at equity, we want to make sure that people are paying their fair share, which is why I've emphasized uh, the number of times to appeal your process of your, your assessments to work on making sure our local governments are living right. The whole concept of TIFs, uh, actually under President Preckman, the, the, the county that has a member uh, on the TIF committees ha has made sure that we are using those dollars for community development. And I think that one of the problems is that TIFs have been viewed as, as a taking of money from right. one community and giving it as a benefit to another. But I, I, I think that we, we want to work with you on our equity. And, you know, as I said, county government is self government. Most people don't know that we haven't raised our property tax levy since 1994. 1994. Uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, the person who's asking the question is trying to figure out how to survive. And we want to help people survive. And, and equity and taxation is part of that survival. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sufferden. Another question, there's a couple more questions. One, another one from Facebook that uh, basically asks, uh, how, how about giving up some of the seven man detail you have to protect you? And this is about, does anyone need that much protection? Um, President Preckwinkle, I, 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 I know some facts around this, but I'll turn that over to you. Well, first of all, I don't have a seven-person detail. That's the, that's the, that was the first. <laughs> um, 
uh, we have four people on the detail and uh, some people who fill in, um, you know, when others are sick or absent or whatever. Um, and their job is to keep me alive and I'm grateful. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and there's other, we, I mean, if we were comparing heads of states, there's, you know, other groups bigger body. So, uh, but we'll move to our last question that I think I can actually address, but I do think you all want to hear. It has to do with accessibility and it is, what is Cook County doing to help the deaf community? Um, their examples were scrolling messages in city buses, cabs, streetlights, etc. cetera. Um, I, I do know two things that I personally am working on, one of which is we just launched, um, President uh, Preckwinkle has helped us convene and launch a disability inclusion working group. And um, several members of that working group are representing the deaf community and, and we are working with them. And we're also in the process of writing a language access policy, which of course would include ASL as part of that. Um, I don't know, President Preckwinkle, is there anything else you'd want to add to those two things that I do know we're doing for the deaf community? No, I'm, first of all, I'm grateful for your presence. Uh, <laughs> we've, needed, we've needed somebody um, to focus on diversity and inclusion for a long time, so we're very grateful that you've joined us, particularly in this extraordinarily difficult time. Um, we've started in the course of the pandemic um, always including uh, an American Sign Language interpreter at our press conferences to try to be sure that um, those who who are hearing impaired have an opportunity to to, uh, to receive the communication message. Uh, but the 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 task force that you're working on will, I think, um, be our view mm -hmm. trying to address this challenge. That's right. And let me just uh, say that Please. the definition you, you started off with, Denise, about what does equity mean? Uh, I want to simplify it to mean it eliminates obstacles. And yeah. what, what we need to be looking at it and, and with our equity lens, making sure that the obstacles at any level of interaction in society were taken care of. And, you know, I, I, the various programs and people that are on this call today are looking at ways of making sure that all people get the same opportunities to succeed. And I'm, I'm grateful to our uh, uh, people who've talked. They've interacted with the county. I, I'd like to just kind of summarize a little how most of them have interacted. Uh, county care has, has been a source of funding, I think, for both peer services and, and for Turning Point. Uh, the Chicago Job Workforce Development, as Charles has talked about, has been there. We haven't been able to come up with funding for people like Marilyn and and I think her concepts of dealing with the, the defunding of the jail, which is what we're going to have to face. I, I reminded the sheriff an hour before we started this call when he was before the budget people that I sponsored the amendment that took away his horse police in uh, 2007. OK, and we're, I told him you're going to have to look at every part of your office to figure out what we're, we're going to have to give up things because we're going to have to spread uh, dollars to other other issues. But our, our goal needs to be to eliminate obstacles to other people. And, and I, I think that we'll have the opportunity to be able uh, to do that. I, I also want to mention that all four of our, our, our panelists have interacted with our court system. Yes. And, and the court system, be it the mental health courts that we have in Skokie or the, the veterans courts that we have in Skokie, that impact our, our area are, are courts that need support services. And many of those we, the services we can't reimburse, but the people that are, are the staffs of these great institutions have helped a lot of folks overcome difficult times. And, and the final thing is uh, the president did this press conference with our, our remarkable medical examiners staff last week. The increase in deaths from opioids is, is something that we have got to figure out what to do. It is a direct result of COVID-19. It is a direct result of people losing their normal patterns of life, maybe losing their jobs, maybe losing their apartments or, or other things. But I, you know, I am so grateful, as I know the president is, to county staff that have keep 
things like our hospital system, the medical examiner's office, the court system functioning during these difficult times. All right. Um, are there any other questions? We don't have anything coming in on Facebook. I've addressed all the questions that were in the chat. Yes, Reverend, Reverend Maryland, please. It's not a question, but I do want to make sure that I acknowledge our partnership with Circles and Cyphers and Nehemiah Trinity Rising, both of, of, of whom do a great work around restorative justice and circle keeping and you know, to go back to the question around generational and systemic trauma. Mm -hmm. so, and um, I'm a trained circle keeper. Many of our staff are trained in restorative practices, no matter what they're doing, because we have to make sure that we are engaging with other human beings uh, as human beings, right? With, yes. with things that we bring and the experiences and, and all that. And so I wanted to acknowledge that and the work of our board president, the Reverend Dr. Christoph Ringer, uh, especially with the work that he's doing around mass incarceration and uh, another board member, the Reverend Danielle Bahuro, who does lots of work around trauma and, and, and has written a book around uh, black lives, the care for black lives. I don't remember the title exactly, but just realizing that as we feed people, as we fight systemic issues, we do need to be healing our communities, healing our institutions so we're not perpetuating trauma, right? Re-traumatizing, like, uh, like Charles says, with our nonprofit gang banging. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned, again, the partnerships that make that deep work possible. So I just want to read a comment that came in, um, not a question, but it just said that um, there's another idea, and this came from someone who's at CETA, is bringing together CBO, FBO, no idea what that means, and agencies that can provide uh, information regarding services that can help folks with all scopes of needs. They commended us to say that this is a great start here today. Um, so wanted everyone to hear that someone. Uh, commended us. All right, Sandy, Sandy, help me out here. It's uh, CBOs are community based organizations. FBOs are faith based. Organizations. Ah, thank you. I am the worst at acronyms. I, I could be somewhere forever and I'm still going to ask you to say it out. <laughs> Please, I, I have a statement, not a question. Yes, absolutely. But, so, you know, in preparing for this uh, town hall meeting, um, you know, I was talking to family and friends, and and I think it's really important that uh, the community understands the difference in equity and uh, uh, versus what is it that I want to say? Equality, uh, maybe. I can't. I'm, I'm losing a thought here. Equity but, and equality. Uh, equality. Thank you. And uh, and and yeah, thank you. And people, I was so surprised that people, most people that I've talked to and just truly didn't understand equity, you know, versus equality. You know, everybody's fighting for equality, but is it really helping the vulnerable populations that we're serving? Because like just using the fence example, you know, you give me a stool and I'm six foot tall, and you're five foot tall, and you give both of us a two foot stool, we're still at the same level, you know? And so I just really want to, uh, commend uh, uh, all of you guys, uh, Madam President, uh, Commissioner Suffered, and also you, Denise, and the rest of the panel, for for focusing on this must most needed idea of equity in our communities and in the world. You know, so I just wanted to close with that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Definitely, that's why I wanted to start us in the grounding of the of the definition, just because I'm in environments all the time mm -hmm. and, and hear folks miss, you know, interchanging those different things. And when we're talking about equity, I want to make sure we're talking about equity. So thank you. All right. I think something, there's a message that may be coming in. Uh, all right, so someone is, it's a medical sort of question. Um, they have, they're following research on psychardian disruption and the white, the light. So basically, um, you know how now that we're all online more, we're dealing with this light. 
um, on our eyes. And it says that some of the unintended consequences are on our physical and mental health. Um, who, they actually have some documents that they want to share about students and people using computers at night so that um, people can raise awareness on wearing blue blockers. Because now that we're all doing so much more computer, our eyes, and I, I definitely wanted to, I want to, first of all, I want to address every question that comes on topic or not, but um, just know that in our chat, we'll make sure to put your documents, um, ma'am, we won't, we won't ignore what your contribution to this town hall. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else who, this is your last chance, we're in our last few minutes, and I will um, give it to Commissioner Suffren and to wrap up in a second. But just want to make sure everyone has had a chance to address anything. This has been a very delightful conversation. And I learned a lot as a person living in this district. And, and um, one thing I would say I wanted to just uh, add about the board members. I, I'm a Gen Xer. And so I'm just now starting to get asked to boards, which I think is funny because I've been really working hard and doing a lot in my community for years. I was elected 11 years ago. I think part of what I want people that are recruiting for boards to do is reimagine what a board member looks like, reimagine what age they are, and reimagine how they can contribute. I think people assumed possibly that, you know, I wasn't ready or I wasn't able. And I just think um, my encouragement to people who are recruiting for boards is get out of your head and look at the non-usual suspects because there's a bunch of us out there. And now that I said that, I can't be on any other boards. I'm on like four, <laughs> <laughs> including the Parks and Rec board here in Evanston. They scooped me up as soon as I got to town. But, but my point is, I think sometimes we have in our minds what a board member looks like or what age they are. And as a a younger person and, and emerging leader, I guess, at 48, I'm emerging, but uh, we need to think about that when we're recruiting board members. Oh, well, looks Denise, like one more question came. Oh, does somebody? Well, does Denise, I, was, I, I was just going to thank you and thank our panelists. And I want to thank President Preckwinkle for, for being part of this discussion. I think Reverend Maryland, as usual, she put the, uh, the issues that are out there. We need the fair tax. That's one of the obstacles that will give us equity because we'll have enough money to run government, as the president just said. I think uh, the living wage and, and the fact that we have a, a minimum wage in the county that is covering most of, of suburban Cook. We're a dollar behind the city, but we catch up next year. Uh, and the issues on money bail, I mean, the we, we were able to get to jail, and I give to President Preckwinkle credit for this, the population was down to 3,900 people for about four days, but the governor basically has uh, not taken any prisoners who've been sentenced, who are no longer detainees, no longer have the presumption of innocence. And we're now up to 4,900 people in the jail. And the, the, we, we, we can't get, be on that kind of a yo-yo uh, issue. We've got to keep figuring out how to get equity and, and, and get there. And the state's got to cooperate but the money bail issue we need to look at, the census issue, and, and you know, on the board member issue, maybe we should be putting together some uh, little meetings and encourage people we know who are good candidates to meet organizations that we know are good organizations. But uh, finally, I just again, thank all of you and thank for having this discussion. And it's now my privilege to give this to President Preckwinkle to uh, make the last remarks, but Denise is gonna make one before you, Tony. <laughs> yeah, it's actually for, I was actually gonna lob it to her. We Our last question came in, which I think is a great setup for, for the close, um, President Preckwinkle. The question was embedded in the definition of equity, it says, is does it include righting a wrong? And And someone said, you know, we have, and we've heard a couple different times about government policies that have perpetuated inequities. Um, so I think that would be a great way for me to turn it over to you. The last question is, does including equity, does it include righting a wrong? Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for their participation. I'm particularly grateful to Commissioner Sufferden for identifying people who would be helpful on this on this call and and to Denise for, for serving as our moderator. Uh, yeah, if you if you think, for example, I, I always acknowledge, you know, we, we live in a society in which racism is endemic and government actions have had a very detrimental effect, particularly on communities of 
of color. If you look at the way our United States government treated our native, our indigenous people, if you look at slavery, which is enshrined in our constitution, uh, if you look at the internment of the Japanese, I mean, there are a million ways in which our government has contributed to inequity, been the sponsor of inequity. We have to acknowledge that as we try to address our present day circumstances. So yes, um, looking at things through an equity lens means acknowledging past sins and working to right wrongs. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. You all have a great rest of your afternoon. It was nice to meet you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.